afternoon and thank you to Columbia University and American Society, Gabriela and everyone else who were being here to listen to this presentation um, that I call an endless architecture but it's basically um, uh, a reduced version of the text of uh, an exhibition we did six years ago in Caracas about art that gave us an architect. It is particularly pleasant for me to be here today and celebrate the new insightful curatorial work done by Gabriela Rangel and Josefina Manrique in the Americas Society Exhibition, Gego, Original Encounter, Master in the Space, but especially to enjoy all the additional collection of work, plans, and drawings brought to us by this exhibition, in particular those regarding the reticularias as they are significantly displayed in one of the original reticularia construction sites. Gego was an architect. Those who want to understand the complete dimension of her work will need to start necessarily from here. This was the main purpose of an exhibition called Gego Architect I was asked to curate for the Fundación Gego and the Sala Attack in Caracas back in 2006. Then I emphasized how acquiring architectural knowledge implies a total change in life how it changes entirely the organization of the mind. It happened to me when I ended my architecture studies here at Columbia University at the GSAP. You cannot fight it, and Gego's oeuvre is a proof of it. Guided by geometry, structure, and construction, the architect's eye, once born, is bound to penetrate everything. Past, present, and future landscapes start weaving a new territory where an endless design process will be unleashed to never stop in its quest for mastering the space. I want to recall here some of the significant points we found that helped in configuring the endless architecture of Gero. And nothing better to begin with than for looking at her city, Hamburg. Gero was born here in 1912. An extraordinary city to begin the biography of an architect with over 2,300 bridges, more than Venice and Amsterdam together. Paul Klee says significantly once, I am an abstract with memories. And so was Gego, an abstract with memories. Klee's lyrical cityscapes and the reticularia compete in the poetic evocation of unending cities and territories. Gego's hometown is a built estuary made of islands, channels, and banks. Not far from the sea, it always had the biggest ships arriving straight to its heart. In the surrounding stands, the solid, vertical, mansard-roofed urban center with its flavor of brick art gables and dotted with expressionist works of art. Like the Angular Chile House by Fritz Hogger from 1923, an urban center also compounded by single commercial units, heavy scale relatives of Peter Baird's work, produced by the local tradition of Hamburg architects, like the Museum of Hamburg History by Fritz Schumacher. Therefore, a city with a beautiful urban architecture, impossible to forget. But also a city populated with naval architecture, vessels and knots wind side loads, sea forces, masses, and whole lines. Nothing more essential to understand structural behavior. The ships with their masts, ropes, steel cables, turrets, and sails wander about the channels of the city and its port with its forest of monumental cranes. Needless to say, they all fascinated Gable. This is the architectural landscape of the first layer of memories of her practice as an architect and the undeniable origin of her architectural vocation. Gago earned her degree of architect engineer from the University of Stuttgart under the tutelage of Professor Paul Bonatz in August 1938. Her final work for a boarding school in Kent had the brickwork drawn with attention and care Whoever observes it can understand how much truth there is in saying that the line of Gego comes from drawing, from architectural drawing, of course. A year later, when she was 27, Gego had to leave abruptly Germany and began a new life in Venezuela. 
It wasn't too long till she started an architectural practice in Caracas. This is a National Geographic magazine image of Caracas in 1938. Her Caracanian architecture consisted of a series of architectural urban collaborations like the plan for Los Caobos from 1940, some interior designs, and a trio of houses. Of these, Quinta El Urape from 1947, a suburban villa of well-balanced spaces and elegant volumes, reflects the classical and monumental spirit of the German neo-academic architecture of the Sculptural Art Museum of Basel 1936 by her professor Paul Bonanzi. And we venture then that the villas in Tanriape wrought iron railings with their beehive pattern pioneered Legego's later Dibujo Sin Papel. It is difficult to imagine Gego after building all these projects abandoning architecture. She asserted, quote, my work and my worry for the visual arts have been gradually developing in me due to a combination of facts mainly to my education as an architect, end quote. From 1947 on, what she actually did uh, was to continue the search for new forms of building spaces, which never stopped from being architectural. As in an abstract city that was only in Diego's mind, her architecture's places in mind were built literally, built literally the way. Therefore, <coughs> All of her artworks, from her Tarma drawings to the academic exercises of her teaching periods, from installations in architectural spaces to her drawings, <coughs> spheres, nets, and reticularias, are all architectures <coughs> that follow one another organized in a rational way. Her 1951-53 Tarma drawings, for instance, like this one, belong to the same lineage as her site analytic analytical perspectives of her student years of the 1930s. These are sketches studying the composition of masses, quote, secret lines that went across the bodies of the geography, end quote. Much later, in 1980, she would re-elaborate re the same color planes separated by white lines and so defining of places. And watercolor drawings that explore with curiosity the elusive interior spaces generated within the reticularias. As according to a vital plan, Gego's architectures progressively constructed a mathematically and topologically conceived spatial, spatial matrix. Point, line, plane, volumes were combined systematically together to address one by one infinite spatial possibilities. That's why the nomenclature is so important. Starting from the diamond shape, three folded triangles, eight squares, globe in a cube or a sphere in an hexahedron. The project titles mark the non fortuitous crystal clear, rational advance in the infinite matrix of combinations. Additionally, this research is rationalized in her academic exercises at the Facultad de Arquitectura of the Ciudad Universitaria de Caracas between 1959 and 1956, and at the Instituto de Diseño of the Fundación Norman from 1966 to 1971. The Taller Diego was updated with her visits to the Architectural Association, Berkeley University, Pratt Institute, and with the influence of personalities like Charles Moore, Serge Shermayev, Sibyl Molinagi, and Siegfried Schillian. As once in the Bauhaus, the students practiced with constructivist, constructivist methods of teaching and once they were done, even the most abstract works looked too much like buildings, like in this <coughs> Gero photograph. Gero herself often, often pictured the works of her students all together, putting up fantastic cities. Between 1961 and 1986, Caracas lived the era of urban art and the increasing demand of, work of works of art in public buildings and spaces. Every new architecture project, every urban renewal, every new urbanism claimed the presence of one or several artists. 
And we clearly understood that Gable, because of her architectural education, had of course to be apart from the other artists because she needed to, no one to understand architectural space. But she did not miss the moment she took advantage of it as alone, working at a different level. Furthermore, her works of integration are like parallel architectures that interact with the buildings in a compositional dialogue through space, as if they were, again, cities, although they were inserted in interior spaces. The buildings of Gebu used the hosted architectures as urban spaces, as the architectural theater of her own art. For her multiple installations, Gebu planned, weighed, defined dimensions, details on the drafting table. Each work turned the base building into a field where new rules would be established. Her architectures emerged, among others, with their own ideas and own laws. In 1961, at the patio between party walls of an art gallery in New York, she first imagined a structure of parallel lines that were perhaps made out of iron. This was the beginning. Afterwards, she would dream of taking this idea much further to eventually build big nets between skyscrapers, starting with the towers of the Centro Simón Bolívar. Quote, I had always had dreams about ridiculares between skyscrapers, end quote. A bit later, sketch of one of these fantastic nets, Reticularia Between Buildings 2 from 1961, during a narrow street of New York, allows us to take a look at how these structures would have looked if they had actually been built. The 1960s were years of fantastic architecture. Working on our exhibition, we made a discovery in her home library's list. The architecture of fantasy, utopian building, and planning in modern times, written by Ulrich Conrad and Hans Sperlich in 1962, which celebrates the legacy left by the expressionist movement of the works of Felix Candela, Bruce Goff, Frederick Kisler, Edge Mendelssohn, and Freyoto. Utopian architectures, cutting edge futurist designs that soon began to resonate in Gable's own creation. We already see the influence in 1976, Torres Díaz, the tall concrete Ed Ad Tower vertically tightened its parallel light nylon lines between two circular rings to produce a double curvature. We thought this might have alluded to the hyperboloid of in revolution of the port tower in Kobe, which is, you can see it in, oh, sorry, in the same picture to your left by architect Hideyuki Tada in 1963. The tower, sung with neon threads, became a powerful sign in the urban landscape at night. Furthermore, Buxmester Fuller visited Caracas Facultad de Arquitectura in 1960, and her architecture, as everyone else's in the faculty, received the impact of the Dimaxion dream. The best example is 1968's Gables Aerial Structure at the Centro Comercial Chacaito, Flechas. Using Fuller's interceptive system, and Gable, quote, lowered the, the weight and increased the strength, end of quote, of her structure, achieving a graceful equilibrium as Fuller's density masks did in the 50s, inspired by, by the cobwebs, cobwebs that float in the hurricanes. Next year, in 1969, Gable installed the Reticularia in the Museo de Bellas Artes. The results of this extraordinary invention affected almost every one of her following works. Let me re review them very quickly. In Cuerdas, 1972, at Parque Central, the commission itself, sorry, I think, there, was already architectural. Making Cuerdas, she said, quote, was like fulfilling a dream, end quote. The resulting interplay of curved surfaces built with parallel groves realized her desire of hanging large nets between buildings. A somewhat novel work, it referred to the landscapes of membranes formed by double curved cables and straight edges being made by many architects at the time, like Boucher, Blondel, and Filippone in the Maritimas Pavillon at the Brussels World Fair and also Freyo. Now, 
Next and measures started to multiply in her work. In 1972, she made a proposal for the Mall Paseo de la Mercedes, ima imagining a vast and fluctuating environmental reticularia hanging from the triple high ceiling and from all levels that look into the space. Later on, she also brought the idea to the Pasaje Concordia with Nubis, an environmental sculpture hanging above a public stair, that introduced the use of fixed bronze joints in Gago's tectonic repertoire. As in Fuller, it was the fascination for joints and articulation. Later in the 80s, she designed a modular aerial net for the meeting root ceiling of the Barco Mercantil and the great environment, quadrilaterals for La Ollada subway station, also with fixed nodes. Her clouds, like floating architectural utopias, were in fact ephemeral architectures were growing between the precision of existing landscapes, just like the city in space by Frederick Kiesler from 1925. With her first reticularia, Gego made a monumental passage. She went from the systematic search of singular space in the, into the exploration of geometric form to the spatial continuum of territorial design. That is why it has been fairly said that all of her work, quote, summarizes in the reticularia, end quote. Her wire architectures would then link with a contextual discourse where space was still the most important issue, only that it had turned into a dialectic space like that, from, like that of a city. The illusory construction of this broader fabric was to generate an infinite and fluid urban sprawl, where urban and natural places melt and follow each other, and where memory and dreams go hand in hand. Like led by Paul Klee's lyrical line, by Le Corbusier's tremulous line, and by the force lines of the hanging cathedrals of Antonio Gaudí. Diego made visible in the air new autonomous visual constructions, her new buildings. These buildings, built like those before them with iron wire, were no longer objects solved solely, but solely by their edges and angles and isolated in space. They now form networks ruled by a triangular or quadrangular structure system creating, in the architect's own words, quote, air, space, void, light, connected traces, continuative triangular links, cells, reticules, series, triangulations, inexhaustible, that were interminable, a eh, of quote, like an endless architecture that could be endless, yes, like the entire universe, but architects, architects, you know, have, <laughs> have had historical and no problem with infinity. They have produced ideas and systems for mastering the space that can reinvent themselves every day at, at infinitum. Like, for instance, the ideal cities of the Renaissance, commanded by perspective, or like Latin American colonial cities, ruled by the laws of the Indies. Gego also, during the extensive process of invention of the great reticularia, confessed her hope of someday being able to develop a system that would allow her design to keep regenerating without the presence of the artist. And we know, this is Caracas, that in the real world, only the city, that collective artwork, regenerates, recreates, and reinvents itself autonomously. That is why we said that the Great Reticularia is a splendid metaphor of the city, a fantastic urban utopia where geometry and order have their place, but in precision and random too. Because thanks to Gego's choice of abandoning her former fixed nodes in favor of flexible joints, her reticularias could become landscapes in perpetual motion that are not just one specific place, but count, countless specific places from the past, the present, and the future. That in the best new Baroque manner flow from one into the other. Landscapes designed by a rational and educated mind of an architect engineer that wanted to express the stages of her soul and also of our souls, their doulers, with their variations of her artificial three-dimensional country come cityscape her personal poetic <coughs> idea of landscape. Each complicated installation of the reticularias introduced several variants every time. Every project generated a different version. This, is, this was partly because situations 
were clearly different in time in ground plan section and facade, but more importantly, because Gabo wanted them to be different. The reticularias were geometrically perfectly conceived, but voluntarily tectonically imperfect. They were built employing loose and movable nodes, changing space closures, dif differently placed troncos and chorros, plus geggos on repeatable craftsmanship. This procedure allowed these reticularias, the reticularias territories to fluctuate and remain poetically elusive. Now I also think that perhaps this was Gego's response to her lifelong parallelism with the exact art of Gerd Leufert. And this is an image from his series of Ganchos. We, as true as the true pedestrians of Gego's nets, move along her reticularias driven by the tensions and contrasts between visual forms and by the perception of virtual spaces along our journey. We follow the geometric net lines, but, and we also create random and unpredictable wefts with our own steps. When crossing a street, we might foresee what looks like a square. When we arrive into that square, we can be attracted by the vision of a patio placed in the center of a building where we shall enter or not, because maybe then we feel the urgent need to climb up some stairs that lead us to the heights of a distant skyscraper emerging on the horizon. We, the citizens of the Reticularias, do not necessarily need to orientate in the labyrinth of the streets, because here, as in the best of cities, we would rather get lost. So to conclude, Gero, as an architect, anticipated the course of things to come with her city in space, also for the architectural world, in the same way that the manual distortions and her nets reflected the fatigue of the grief that modernity experienced at the end of the last century. The linked architectures and faces of her nets were prophetical in their shapes, contortions, mutations, turns, folds, deformations, movements, and especially in their transparencies of the architectures that followed them. Just recall some of the latest clouds that take shape in the horizon, the weaving landscapes, the transparent roofings, based on various geometrical grids, the alveolar steel structures and the eventual architectures of this distorted sculpture of bodies and expressionist spirits that pop up everywhere. Contemporary architecture is today at times topographical and also at times geographical. As what happened in 1969 with the reticularia, much of today's architecture seems aspiring to be an environmental installation located at the confines of contemporary art. And here we see Gabriel contemplated her other, her other city, Caracas. Thank you. to 
talk to Mr. Fuller, as we were saying earlier, it's counter to a lot of the architectural models that you introduced. Mm. It, it, isn't it? Well, the wonderful thing about this symposium is that we have uh, seen so many perspectives and analyzed the word, uh, the word of Gegos uh, from many points of view, and architecture is no less. But of course, I, I didn't have the chance to meet her ever, but I, I worked a year with her papers. And uh, of course, I, I received also the influence of being a student in that architecture school where, where uh, the, the compositional uh, first level of studies were designed by Gago. So in a way, she formed our minds. So um, uh, this perception of constructing a, in an organized way, of an order, uh, for me, it's an absolute, it's an absolute. and that it, it shifts and changes according to the, the different uh, desires and influences and moments in her life. It's also part of the part of the discourse, but I think that the that the line is very very uh, well thought and, 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 and uh, from a rational mind, as I said before. And uh, I have always heard from many people that uh, Gego needs to be uh, studied from a mathematical point of view. She, I think uh, her daughter is a mathematician. And uh, uh, that part, which is the, like one of the poles, uh, we need to put closer, closely to, to that part. But, uh, can, can you go back to the slide, of, the last slide of the Fundaria that you showed, about four slides back? Um, uh, the one before this. This, to me, is a very peculiar kind of order. I mean, I'm, I have no doubt that this is mathematically put together. I have no doubt that there was a plan. But something else is going on here. Um, you know, mathematics, if it's pushed to the limit, becomes a humanities. It becomes philosophy. And, and to a certain extent, this is mathematics at that point. Well, I was, I, I was very impressed by Sylvia's presentation because I think this, the, 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 Sylvia's rational mind is impressive in a way that, you know, it, I think it's rather almost impossible to put up again at the Reticularia as it was in the first, in the first, the first time. Is that true? No, I think it's absolutely impossible. It's, it's absolutely you impossible. you replicate, you don't interpret. Uh, mm -hmm. And it comes to the question that Alex raised before, can one commission the work the way John and Solar Beach you know, no, you can't. You can replicate, yes. but you, you know, it's not that the, she, as she said, by the way, she was invited to uh, exhibit at the United Evans Museum, oh, and, and uh, she couldn't because her, she had had an accident, and she wrote a letter saying, I wish to develop one day a system, which is what Sylvia is doing, where the work can be installed without me. So it could be done. It didn't. She didn't have those means at the time. Mm -hmm. But it would be the sort of, in a way, uh, the will of the artist or the intention of the artist or I mean, whatever. The, 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 uh, the, what would we, we attempt to replicate? She didn't think of it as something. Okay, I give instructions and it's done. I mean, those are not available to to Gage at the time. There's no conceptual art. Um, I mean, she's not. That's not her horizon, right? That's not her immediate intellectual horizon, it, like the, the, the relinquishing of the hand. So I, I, I can bring up, um, I mean, into this discussion, I think she, what you were talking about in terms of the mathematical scrub, scrub, um, uh, image that you are saying, I think Gay will always strive to marry intuition yeah. and rationality. And that is the whole point of her work. And that marriage, is, it, it, it was so important, even didactically, in the way she taught, in the problem in which the student had to come up with their own process. Through intuition, because the student didn't have experience. And, and that she practiced that herself mm -hmm. throughout her work. And, 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 and I think that it's very important to bring to the discussion of order. Because it was not, it's not only, uh, uh, it's not only mathematics and order, it's also the play between intuition and what you know. Yes, but what, once you take a look at the whole work, mm -hmm. and you start looking at one work and then the other, and then the next, for example, you go through all those huge uh, studies that have been done, and one of the greatest uh, problems I had during this the architecture exhibition was, 
going through all the studies about, about the different and infinite almost uh, amount of ideas for producing new works of art, you should have an order because in other words, you repeat yourself. It's it's like uh, uh, it's very easy to see in the analysis that made a Ruth Hour back in, from the times from philosophy exercises in the Instituto de Diseño. It's very clear to see that she was absolutely, in my opinion, was rushing in, in the making. Uh, I, 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 I want to call attention to the title of your, 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 uh, your study, the, the Infinite Space of, of Gago's work. Because I think the question of scale is very, very interesting in, in the fabrication of her work. Because she figured out a way to build the work modularly with fairly small elements and that could be adapted to any scale of space. And, and you can see that in the reticularias, or you can see that in the installations in Parque Central with the ropes, or you can even see that in the entrance to the Estudio Actual, which you showed in Chacaito. That the, these, uh, the, 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 the very much like a, an architect's conception of a way that space is always infinite. And, and, and that infinite quality of space has to be respected. And yet, the way to approach it is to figure out a modular system that can then be constructed. Is that something that you consider? Well, I, I titled the presentation today An Endless Architecture, and I see that also Sylvia used the word endless, um, because I was also very, basically, basically referring to the reticularia as the work that summarizes the whole system of, of searches in her life, and everything is there, and at least in the memory of the of And uh, it, the, the finding that the notes move, it, it, it helps, it pushes the work to me, you know, it's an idea that captivated my mind in terms of that metaphorical sense of a territory that is always growing and always receiving her new inventions. Can you, uh, because in the matrix of words, she organized the, the research on every um, the geometric figure she, she was studying, and then she ended that part and, come in, and started another one. And so she could have continued for many centuries more <laughs> if she would. She would. Thinking that uh, after all these uh, presentations that were so wonderful, uh, maybe we should think a little bit of um, Sorry? as the artist, uh, intuitively, forgetting about all the um, geometry or the architecture, which is already intuitive in, in her. But could we talk a little bit of how as a, the artist and not the architect or the mathematician or the scientist. Of course, mm -hmm. there is a taste and a spirit in doing her art, mm -hmm. and she forgets what she wants to forget, of course, but the, the knowledge is there. And uh, when I, uh, the studying how she was, uh, she was educated as an architect, I mean, the, the University of Stuttgart was said uh, to be the, the most uh, finest architectural school in Germany, um, when facing on the other side of the bubbles, but I mean, the academic traditional very good school for me. She was formed as an engineer. I don't think that it can be that easily forget, and that's my point of view. Of course, there are many other things that she was interested in, and she built another kind of architecture, which is for art. Yes, my, uh, my question um, regards also uh, because of the fact that uh, you see in Calatrava, the, there's always the engineer uh, the architect, uh, if you uh, uh, want to uh, think, you know, in space, in space, uh, in volume. But, but I can be absolutely different. It's another thing. It's not because he's, he's, he's an architecture and engineer. He has a language, and uh, he's not claiming for himself that he's an artist, like Gero. You know, there is a question here. Uh, yeah, you said something really interesting about uh, Bollinger, about a system that regenerates 
uh, that she's trying to create. And also, you, you uh, spoke to us as citizens of the reticular <coughs> spaces of the everyday and joining with what they said before, that she was trying to create, to dissolve space at the same time. So that leads to this uh, space, and it's not, it's in the verge between architectural space and art. So it's an inhabitable space. You cannot really live in that uh, installation. So how, from that, you get back to the uh, regenerating space, if you, well, the, the, the idea of regenerating was was said by her, and, and you know, I was based, I was based in one of her um, lines, saying that she she would like to invent something that would regenerate for and forever, and that for, for example, this reticularia could come out of the work of the of, of the doors of the Galleria d'Arte Nazionale and extend over the whole uh, well, valley of Caracas if if you would let let it do it, you know. <laughs> Because it's an idea and, 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 and it's a project and has a way of being built. And the nodes are flexible and they can, you know, get everywhere and pass over everything. And you can have endless tales or endless memories expressed or seen or perceived as the actual city is. But to what point do you think she actually achieved this? Since we cannot reveal, of course, it would be. Well, of course, it, that's my personal point of view because I'm an artist. Yeah. So uh, that's what I see in the reticularia, and that's why I love the reticularia because for me it's absolutely uh, the most, one of the beautiful metaphors of what I feel in the city is. And this is why I, I wrote this piece. Okay, thank you very much.